gentlemen, let's start getting into the evidence of this being a cover-up. But, but, but just briefly mentioning what happened at that time, I was obviously glued to television and radio covering the 9-11 attacks myself. And 9-11 kind of built its peak of hysteria, and then suddenly the anthrax, and for a week or two, it was as big as the 9-11 attacks, and they were taking over the Capitol and the federal government. The executive was ordering the Capitol evacuated, which was a violation of the separation of powers, and Democratic enemies were getting sent anthrax, and people that had taken photos of the Bush daughters in Austin falling down on each other drunk, in a provocative pose, we're getting the letters, and it was clearly meant to blame it on Muslims. And the FBI said, this is run-of-the-mill, no big deal, but I had bioweapons experts on saying this is incredibly deadly. Only Russia, the United States, and England can make it this deadly. Then it turned out it was the super miniaturized, with the bentonite, magnetized. I mean, it was the special, you know, you know sci-fi grade U.S. signature. And, of course, the film covers that. And then the, then the different patsies and then murdering a patsy. And they finally got a patsy they could shut up because, uh, you know, the last two patsies were proven innocent. So let's go over that. But, but I mean, you guys are journalists, TV guys. You were there at the time. Was it for a week or so the anthrax as big as 9-11? And then it's like it never happened. Absolutely. I mean, you know, this was our uh, sort of scariest nightmare come to life, the attack of invisible germs. You know, this is something we could not see. Uh, these were, you know, who sent it? It went through the mail. This was an attack against all of us because it was sent through the mail. This is going to have gone to, to everybody. and it was Everybody the gets the mail, the perfect psychology. Go Absolutely. ahead. Yeah. And, and, and in some ways it also fed on, uh, on our fears that had been tickled, let's say, by so many of these Hollywood movies about, uh, you know, bio attacks. But here it was, you know, real life. And um, so, yeah, it caused huge panic um, across the U.S., across the globe. There were copycat attacks, um, you know, Cipro, this antibiotic that uh, was the treatment uh, for anthrax. Their stocks went through the roof. People were buying Cipro. But as you said, um, Alex, you know, after a couple of weeks of being in the headlines, the story faded. The FBI announced it had this huge investigation. But it's pretty, pretty quickly seemed that that investigation was uh, not going anywhere. I mean, they had they a had so-called person of interest, um, this army scientist by the name of Stephen Hatfield. And very early on, the FBI were convinced that they could blame it on one person. There was a lone gunman. You know, there was just one person behind this. Um, and that's one of the things that we decided to look at. We said, well, actually, you know, it's much bigger than this. We've actually got to look at this from an international perspective because, you know, the, 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 the kind of anthrax that was sent, especially to Congress, was very, very sophisticated. Uh, when they, uh, when the FBI scientists examined the uh, the anthrax that was used in the attacks against the congressman, um, that anthrax, when they examined it in the lab, in this uh, BSL three lab, uh, high containment lab, they put it on a microphone, uh, a, a microscope, and the anthrax actually lifted up and floated into the air. And the scientists had never seen any kind of anthrax of this sophistication ever before. So this was super sophisticated anthrax and it really meant that this had come out of a state sponsored program. You That's right. I mean it was a US government weapon strain. It was miniaturized, it was magnetized, it was coated in bentonite, it was made to float around. Well uh the thing was the original report said it was coated in bentonite. Now it's put so that's wrong. By it yeah. is wrong, and it was put forth by ABC News correspondent Brian Ross. There was no bed night in that, but it was very useful because uh, U.S. intelligence had identified bentonite as a additive that the Iraqis had. So you see how the administration began to say, aha, oh. there's an Iraqi connection because of this bentonite yeah. connection. Well, well, but well fact, stay there, gentlemen. Uh, I want to go over this. I want to go over this anthrax war. We've got to go to break. When we come and this film is really well done. Everybody needs to see Anthrax War. I mean, the, the White House, Ari Fleischer admitting that the, much of the White House was on Cipro starting September 10th through the attacks. 
but nobody else was when they knew it was going to be going through the Capitol mail system and some of it to the White House. I mean, this is really, really suspicious. Uh, but that's only one area. Uh, going back to our guests, the makers of Anthrax War, Bob Cohn and Eric Nadler, uh, you guys know how to tell this story best. You guys have got the floor. This is a short segment. Long one's coming up. Run through uh, what the film covers, the evidence, of, and, and bottom line, what your conclusion is, what the anthrax attacks really were in anthrax war. Well, the deal is uh, one has to look at um, who benefited and who gained ultimately from the anthrax attacks. When the uh, FBI named lone male man uh, Bruce Ivins as their guy, they said he had uh, a profit motive, $2,000 government contracts or whatever, to get the anthrax vaccine that he was working on in Fort Detrick, Maryland, to be uh, reinvigorated and uh, put forth for the U.S. Uh, military troops. We asked a legitimate question. If they're saying profit motive for a lone gunman, who really made money off these attacks? And we have to be careful here. We're not really pointing any fingers, but we're suggesting that uh, one looks at what is the real legacy of the anthrax attacks. And without a doubt, uh, within the last few years, uh, the U.S. government, in the wake of the anthrax attacks, has leased 50 to 60 billion dollars in what they call biodefense contracts to fight against bioterrorism. And one of the things we do in the film, and one of the things we do in the book, is begin to examine the corporate connections, who's making the money, who's making the 50 to 60 billion dollars. And once the FBI lets the profit motive as the attack uh, lay into Ivan's, we think that's a real legitimate place to look. And in the book, uh, we, pay, we, we spend a lot of time looking at very politically wired corporations that um, have benefited, no doubt, through government contracts in the government response to the anthrax attacks. Absolutely. And, uh, in fact, expanding on that, and I want Mr. Cohn's take on this as well, uh, and of course yours, Mr. Nadler, is, as you said, 50 plus billion dollars for BioShield and other programs, level four bioweapons labs in major cities, expanding the U.S. bioweapons program in a, a cover for uh, bioweapon defense. Even mainstream news has admitted that. They wouldn't have gotten all of this if it wasn't for the anthrax attacks. They got all those major contracts and that policy shift in the war on terror right after the anthrax attack. Absolutely. I mean, uh, certainly that has been one concrete result of the anthrax attacks. Is uh, the birth of uh, what we describe as the bioterror military industrial complex. And the, the, the other troubling thing about all this is that what used to be the domain of secret government programs is now privatized. So we have private corporations who are doing the classified research um, that's going on in private labs, in university labs, in private research foundations all around the country. People have no idea what's going on in those labs.